Peter, do you want to say something? Just picking up on one of the things Al said, uh, if heresy precedes orthodoxy, I think that apologetics precedes heresy, uh, as in most heresies historically begin as apologetic movements. And I say that as someone who's involved in apologetics and likes it. But, you know, it's liberal theology is an attempt to rescue Christianity from deep embarrassment. And that's how a lot of these things begin. And that's why those of us who are involved in apologetics need to be quite careful uh, uh, about that because it can uh, lead to Can you error. flesh that out for us a little bit so we really understand good. more? Well, I think what people are trying to do often is save the Bible from embarrassment and so if, or Christianity. And so if they can have a Christianity which somehow can explain away those difficult texts and, and, and sideline them, they, I mean, these people often, they, in the first generation, they want people to come to Christ. Uh, and they sincerely believe that this is the best way to do it. And the way people get seduced sometimes into abandoning Scripture or authority is when they become persuaded that uh, that thing which uh, adheres most to their dreams and aspirations, the sort of thing uh, Lig was talking about of, of, of um, uh, what, what Elijah had, they get persuaded just to go for that. Um, and so they think more people are going to come to Christ if I just water this uh, down somewhat. Sometimes people become persuaded in theological education that they are being more faithful to the text if they read it in a way which is contrary to another text. And then and it appeals when people have been brought up in a Christian context to value the authority of the Bible and they become persuaded that the most honest reading of a text is to read it so it con contradicts with another one. That often is very enticing. Mm. So tr trying to make the Bible make sense to people who don't believe is a necessary and dangerous thing. Al? Well, and, and Pete's exactly right. Liberal theology is a succession of rescue attempts uh, for the reputation of Christianity. But just to give an example of what he's talking about so we can all understand it, you have Rudolf Bultmann for instance, uh, it, who in one of his books simply says, people who use electric lights don't believe in a supernatural universe. So in other words, if you're going to reach modern people, and you find the same thing in people like Harry Emerson Fosdick and, and, and others who simply said, look, we're in a modern world. We're going to have to bring Christianity into intellectual credibility with a modern world. So a lot of the things you see being claimed right now are as old as the heretics that the church fathers faced, and certainly in terms of Protestant liberalism, what the church has faced for over 100 years. Another example of that is the very fountainhead of modern liberalism in Schleiermacher. Schleiermacher was offended by the doctrine of the penal substitutionary atonement of Christ and, and the uniqueness of Christ. And, and, and he looked out at Germany and he said the, the German intellectuals are rejecting Christianity in droves. They're impacted by the the enlightenment and the message of Christianity must change if we are going to be able to capture this generation for Christianity. He wasn't sitting around trying to figure out a way to destroy Christianity, but he in fact did that with apologetic missionary motives in reaching his culture. And so the, the liberalism's fundamental premise is that the message must change if Christianity is going to survive and effectively engage the culture or going right the way back to Marcion in the second century. Marcion's deeply embarrassed by the Old Testament and by the Jewishness of Jesus. He, as an apologist, thinks that he can commend Christianity far better by ditching those things. So that's where the becoming an apologist actually led straight to the heresy.